do a sound check here. Okay, so um, hi everybody, welcome. Welcome to this balmy Wisconsin day. It's, uh, last I checked, it's 42 degrees outside. That's well above freezing. That's uh, pretty, pretty sweet in my book. Um, so how is everybody doing? Did we all have a good weekend? Yes, good, good. Okay, um, well, uh, I guess every once in a while I like to give you some tidbits of just sort of like what's going on uh, in my sort of, you know, art making practice. So something kind of exciting happened for me this weekend. Um, I'm, in fact, I have to say I can't think of anything more exciting for a computer nerd um, to get a new workstation. Um, I bought myself a new graphics workstation, um, and I haven't probably, it's been, you know, five or six years um, since I bought my last workstation. Um, so, yeah, I did some uh, shopping and comparison shopping. I read a lot of reviews. And um, I decided to go with um, this company called Origin PC, which is a custom PC builder. Um, they specialize in gaming desktops and also in graphics desk desktops. So one of the things that I need for my computer is the ability to uh, be kind of high performance and to render um, all the polygons and all of the 3D information. So um, yeah, um, it just sort of, I know we're all working off of our laptops and working off of you know, the machines in the lab. Um, but if you do decide to continue on further with um, this type of stuff, particularly with 3D animation and 3D rendering and 3D design, um, you do uh, need a little extra computing power for that. Um, now, I guess we could ask the question, you know, do you really need it? And I guess it depends on what kind of work you would like to do. I mean, I have a MacBook, a not super special MacBook Pro here, and I've been working with the MacBook Pro for probably like the last, you know, 10 years, and that MacBook Pro does about 70% of what I need it to do. Um, that other 30% is this type of like, you know, 3D animation, rendering, um, getting a really high frame rate on gaming, if you're interested in that. Um, and those are the types of things that like a custom sort of graphics workstation can get you. So anyway, um, uh, I'll, uh, at the end of the semester, I'll, I'll, get, I'll report back and let you know uh, if I really like it or not. I literally unboxed it this weekend, and it was like all kinds of nerdy. I was like, oh. um, and yeah, that's just pretty much how it is. So um, today, uh, we're going to kind of continue along thinking about the history of art and technology. We're going to kind of move into recent history. Um, and by recent, I mean basically like after the advent of the actual, what we would consider today, um, a computer. It doesn't actually bear a lot of resemblance to what we now consider computers, um, in that it's uh, much, much larger uh, physically. But um, we will uh, kind of start there today. Before I begin with that, does anyone have any questions about anything kind of moving forward, just class stuff? No? Okay. All right, well, let's take a look at the slides. So um, we have, uh, as usual, we have study, uh, study questions for you. Um, I'm gonna say it again. These study questions bear a striking relationship to the questions that are on the midterm. They're not word for word the midterm questions, um, but they do tend to emphasize the same key concepts that you would see on the midterm. Um, and that's why I put them there. So um, when we think about computers and we think about computer art, um, you know, we probably had things like we were looking in the last lecture into sort of uh, World War II and just nearly post-World War II days. And they did have things that computed, um, but they weren't really at the level where they were able to produce graphics or able to produce any kind of graphical output. So if we look at you know, when computers st started gaining the ability to actually output graphical information, that happened in this period between the 60s and uh, in this, well, really probably like 1960. Um, and then you see that just kind of continue into the future. Um, I do think it's really important to talk about computer art um, 
and talk about some of its maybe um, cultural shortcomings. Um, what do I mean by cultural shortcomings? Well, there were sort of very narrow uh, outlets for computers back in the 60s. Um, you basically had to be at a top tier research university in an industrialized country uh, like England, Japan, United States, Germany, these types of, uh, you know, what we would call highly industrialized uh, economies. You also had to be working in a research university at the time. And at this time, um, research universities were not terribly diverse places. Um, women and minorities, while slightly present, um, we can certainly find, you know, a few instances of people who were kind of breaking ground at this time. Uh, but largely, this is a field of, of white men. Um, and that's pretty much kind of how it all got going. Um, of course, there are exceptions, like, you know, research activity that's going on in Japan um, and other uh, countries that are certainly probably, you know, that are considered non-white. So um, I think it's also interesting to think about this idea of, like, technological uh, knowledge centers being created. And we can certainly see that happen um, in our own country, and it actually happens to this day. Um, where are the two technology centers in this country? Well, one is Silicon Valley, the San Francisco Bay Area, right? Um, the other is Boston, uh, sort of the hub around MIT and all of the research universities of Boston. Um, there are other cities that are starting to catch up, like Austin. I might even put Chicago on the map, um, certainly New York. Um, but those cities still sort of like, you know, aren't kind of coming from this like, um, original history of really there was a center on the East Coast, a center on the West Coast, and then you start to see this kind of Midwestern activity in Chicago really kind of like fulfilling that myth of Chicago being the second city, sort of like lagging behind what's going on on the East and West Coast. So, so what you do see are these sort of like areas in which there's kind of a tech scene, right? Um, and definitely something that's important for art making is this idea of a scene and a community. Um, because uh, as much as I love to just like sit in my studio and show my work to my cat, um, that's not really like a, a foundation for me to, you know, reach out to uh, a public, right? Or reach out to an audience. Um, so for art, in order for art to kind of disseminate itself, there needs to be some sort of like critical mass of people that are actually interested in looking at it. Um, and you start to see that in these, in these areas. So slightly ahead of computer art, there was this sort of interest in like, in making work with machines that were not necessarily intelligent. They may have just, like, in this example, this machine is just kind of doing what it does. It's a mechanical machine that has some uh, random variation built into the way that the gears work. Um, and, and that type of uh, activity um, sort of led to this idea of computer art. So um, is there, like, a very first, you know, piece of computer art? Probably, maybe there is, but that's the kind of thing that academics are going to fight over, kind of like who created the internet. Um, we can only maybe point to some very early examples, <laughs> and this is certainly an early example. Um, one of the characteristics of computer art was that very early on, um, it was really about engineers and scientists trying to create graphics or trying to create pictures and they didn't really care if it was art you know they were more sort of asking questions like can i get a computer to do this right so it was purely functional um, at some point some of those engineers decided hey maybe i can call this art or maybe this is art and so they took what they were already doing in their research labs and they just put it in an art context and basically said, hey, my, my machine made this and why don't you look at it as art? Um, so this is a good example of that. Um, this person is using algorithms to basically um, create this visual sort of pattern. Um, and 
you know, it sort of fulfills this requirement of uh, the first computer art piece. Um, but it, it's really not the first piece of computer art. It's just the first piece of computer art that was actually copyrighted. Um, so, you know, it's one of those kind of things that uh, people love to argue about. Um, if you uh, click into this um, video, it should be um, inter it should be somewhat interesting. So, um, the way that most early computer art was written uh, was with what's called a pen plotter, and it is literally um, a pen plotter is two uh, beams that are held kind of like a 3D printer. If you've ever seen a 3D printer. Um, it moves the head, right? It moves the pen around and just literally draws the drawing. Um, the main difference between a pen plotter and a 3D printer is that it doesn't move up and it doesn't extrude plastic, right? But it's still that fundamentally the same technology um, of what people call CNC or computer numeric control um, uh, fabrication. Um, so. So a lot of the work that we're going to look at in the next like 10 images or so are going to be simple line drawings. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why early computer art is kind of dominated by lines. Well, one, one reason is because it doesn't take very much processing power to make a line, uh, because a line is just a connection between two points, right? So all you have to define are the points and whether they have you know, a connection between them or not. So just from a computing perspective, it's incredibly efficient. Um, pix by the way, pixels, pixels didn't even exist yet. Um, they may have existed on the screen, but like the idea of, um, they may have existed like on a computer monitor, but the idea of actually drawing or printing or rendering pixels um, just really didn't, ha um, it wasn't a thing. So thinking about like this idea of taking what you're doing in a research context and making it art, the first sort of reaction to computer art by the art public was basically like, you all are a bunch of, um, oh, what's a good word for that? Yeah, I'm trying to think of a somewhat uh, dismissive term that's not offensive. Um, how about this? Y'all are a bunch of, Mm, no, you know, I can't really think of one. But basically, they were regarded with a lot of uh, dis dismissiveness, like just saying, this is like BS. You just took what you made in a lab, and you're trying to make us think that you're an artist, right? Um, so I can't overstate like how negatively <laughs> computer art was, was viewed um, by the sort of like larger art public. Um, especially, um, well, probably well into the 1980s. Um, you see these um, essays and articles written about computer art basically, you know, dehumanizing um, the entire, dehumanizing like humanity because it's taking away this fundamentally human activity, which is art making, like with, you know, a paintbrush. Um, and anyway, I could go on and on about early, <laughs> early computer sort of um, uh, dismissiveness and early computer uh, sort of criticism. But um, the point of saying all this is that, you know, just a couple years later, this is three years later from the pr previous slide, this artist is actually trying to mimic a, a work of art, a famous painting, by making this. And so this artist, I call him an artist because he's regarded as an artist now. Um, but he's basically, this artist is saying, hey, like, I'm making this thing. It has a relationship to art. It has, my intention is to make art. Um, I'm not just, like, taking something from, you know, some rando thing from my bag and, like, saying that. That right there is art. Um, and that's kind of what people thought that they were trying to do. Um, so you start to see in the, like, just a couple years after the start of this, you start to see um, artists be a little bit more self-conscious about making art. Um, and you also see, and this is another sort of like check in the category of computer art at the time equals not art. Um, 
is that a lot of computer art was actually graphic design or done for the purposes of industrial design or to solve a problem, right? So in terms of like art stereotypes or things that make something not art, um, this mask is not art because I can use it, right? Um, and so the fact that this graphic right here is useful, even though it's beautiful and it's um, got a lot of interesting uh, visual detail, also not art. So it's important to note also, you know, I was talking earlier about access and how you had to be, you know, a certain type of person to really access computers back in this day. Part of the big reason that that's true, um, some of it had to do with, you know, system systemic inequities, um, such as racism and sexism and all that stuff. Um, one other factor that led to, you know, this idea that computers were something that you get in your car, drive to the research building, you know, plop yourself down and use this thing, um, was just their sheer physical scale. So this is like a pretty, uh, pretty common scenario for a mainframe in the, in the early 70s. Um, so what you see are literally every single one of these cabinets is filled with reel-to-reel -reel tapes, like magnetic tape. And as you can see, this one computer um, takes up like it's the size of a large room, right? Um, also, in this sort of scenario, you would basically interact with a terminal. This is the terminal. There's your little chair. Um, and these are sort of the data. This is the data storage and the processing. So it was a really very fundamentally different way of interacting with computers. Like, you could think about writing something at home, like writing a piece of code, and then getting in your car, driving to the building, putting it through, you know, on a punch card. There's little pieces of paper, I'm not joking, little pieces of paper with holes poked in it, um, and then you would run it and see if it works, right? So the type of fluidity and the type of even physical, I won't say, maybe intimacy, but the type of familiarity that we have, physical familiarity that we have with our devices, is nowhere near um, what the relationship that people had with computing at that time. And by the way, this mode of computing persisted into the 80s um, until, the, until the development of the personal computer. So when we look at um, early computer art, we see a lot of tendencies that are sort of, um, I would say, common, common tendencies. We see a lot of grid-organized compositions. Um, we see a lot of l linearly dominated compositions. Um, and uh, this particular image is actually a really good example of computer art because it takes something that is really regular, like the grid, and then imposes like a series of variations on it. That's a really common strategy in computer, early computer art. Um, here is, she's basically, um, this artist is basically called like the grand dame of computer art. Um, I don't, I'd like to say she's not the only woman who was in early computer art, but she's certainly uh, the only person who is sort of like known in the field today. Um, and I have to say, like, I have a like, special place in my heart for her because she's actually 90-some years old. She lives in France, and she's still making this work. Yeah, it's just incredible. Um, so if you're in the mood for, like, kind of an um, uplifting video about an artist, she's a good person to Google. Um, so moving forward a little bit, you can see... Uh, this, and again, this pose is completely borrowed from art history, right? Um, there's a famous Manet painting called the Odalisque, of basically the, the sort of reclining nude. Um, what, the, what this image is significant for is that it basically started sort of, um, or popularized the idea of making images with pixels. Um, and you start to see what's known as uh, dithering, and other sort of techniques. Now, are these pixels? No, absolutely not. <laughs> they are not pixels. 
They are um, ASCII characters, right? Um, so literally typographic characters that you would find on uh, a printer wheel. Um, and one of the reasons why this artist used ASCII characters is, well, it's kind of cool, I guess. Um, that's one reason. Another reason that ASCII characters were used is that the printers that were available to people at that time actually had a giant ball. Um, you know the Wikipedia logo? It actually looks kind of like the Wikipedia logo, where it's a ball that has characters on it. And this ball just spins around and prints the characters, right? Um, so it's called an impact printer. And um, it's very similar to, if you've ever heard of a dot matrix printer, uh, it's very similar technology. But um, the idea being that you couldn't really just print tone, right? Or you couldn't print like a box with a certain number of dots. Like that technology didn't exist. So this artist decided, well, I'm going to use uh, typed characters. And so this whole development of ASCII art um, is kind of a big deal. And it's sort of, um, I mean, if you're a super nerd, uh, ASCII art is still totally a thing. Um, if, if you look for it on Google, it'll just come up with like scrolling, a scrolling nightmare of uh, ASCII images. Um, and the cool thing about ASCII images is that you could cut and paste them into like your email, or even um, if you're lucky, you could uh, do it in like a, a you know, Facebook message or something like that. So you can, it's, it's used a lot in messaging technologies. So, okay, so we're finally like into the so-called computer, personal computer revolution, which has now been probably about 30 years since, or maybe even longer, maybe 40 years since computers were first developed. And somebody finally decided hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could have a computer that I didn't have to get in my car and go visit? And there were more than like one computer in every town? Yeah, that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Um, so I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, um, Apple is credited with the um, development of the personal computer by most, uh, most people in a sort of common sense way. I do think it's worth noting that it was actually a company called Xerox that developed the personal computer. Um, they just were not able to market it successfully. And so their computer uh, actually predates the Apple II um, by quite, a, quite a four or five years. Um, and uh, we'll watch a video about uh, patents and um, originality in art and technology. And um, we might kind of investigate this narrative that Apple sort of invented the personal computer. Um, because that's sort of like saying that um, maybe that Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> um, it's not necessarily true. <laughs> um, but they did certainly, um, I think what I will give them credit for is that they did certainly popularize the, com the personal computer. And they uh, put the com personal computer out into households all over all over the world. So um, when we think about personal computers, you know, um, I don't like to make assumptions about you know, how old people in this room are. Um, so I'm just going to tell you, uh, in case you were or weren't alive at this time, um, personal computers probably didn't really become prevalent in most households until the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and at that point, you would really see people like, you know, families having computers. Um, into, you know, the early 80s, sure, the Apple is out, um, and maybe people who are tech enthusiasts um, have one, but it didn't necessarily become like, you know, this sort of cultural force um, into the 80s and 90s. So when we look at this stuff being made in the 80s, it's in kind of an interesting, um, it's an interesting transition period for art and for technology. This was a time when a lot of artists still couldn't really get access to p powerful computers that they could like stick in their bag. Um, they still had to go to research institutions and you know fancy places. Sometimes even corporations would invite artists in to work with their hardware. Um, and that's really kind of a lot of the type of work that you see in the early 80s and into the late 70s. Um, so 
You can also see that in the 80s, there's this, there's this sort of like light speed change in terms of computer graphics. Um, so the 80s really was sort of like the decade when computer graphics even became a thing. Um, like the original Star Wars movies that were made in the late 70s, did they use computer graphics like at all? They did not, <laughs> because it wasn't a thing back then. Um, so you start to see in the 80s, like, movie effects and special effects and this type of, you know, like, popularizing of computer graphics. You also start to see in the 80s the advent of almost all of the software programs that we still use today. Um, so Adobe Photoshop, for example, fun fact, uh, I am old enough to have used the very first version of Photoshop. <laughs> which was created in 1988. Um, it was so cool. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I mean, it really wasn't. But um, yeah, it's uh, definitely, um, I think pe sometimes people don't realize just how long Photoshop has been around. Um, also, something worth noting is that Photoshop was not initially an Adobe product. Um, Photoshop was actually bought by Adobe in the late Early, in the early 90s. Um, and so in the 80s and 90s, we had like a large number of software and technology corporations. And I'm sure you all might have heard something about this on the news, or maybe if you you know read about uh, technology consolidation. Um, what happened in the 80s and 90s is that a lot of those, uh, co those corporations just got bought out by each other. And now we have a very small number of technology corporations, right? Um, and, you know, I can definitely uh, talk about that for a really long time. That's sort of the state of, of where things are now, right? Um, that we maybe have where we used to have hundreds and hundreds of software companies. We probably have maybe 10 now. <laughs> um, and is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, I don't know. I would... There's good and bad things about it, but... Um, so the 80s was still a time when people could start up like a little software company and make a product called Photoshop. Um, and I think you know, now that space is just so full uh, and so mature that there's really just not that level of opportunity. So um, you also see in the 80s, along with this sort of conversation of, you know, the 80s being the age of graphics, um, you also see this huge explosion in digital photography and digital imaging with pixels. Um, and so the whole idea that things are being rendered to pixels and that you're looking at pixels on a screen, um, that's something that really sort of like took hold in the 80s. Um, prior to that, you're actually, you know, looking at a char character-based um, display. Um, also, in the 80s, I think the 80s was definitely the beginning of this, like, kind of, I won't say it's stupid, but it was sort of like, in retrospect, you can look back at it and say, man, what were they thinking? Um, but this sort of optimistic um, craze for technology and technological pro projects to sort of interface with our everyday life. Um, and so you start to see like imaginary shows about uh, this show called Max Headroom was a, a really crazy show called um, about this television host who was pretending to be a computer animated character, but he was actually a real guy in a costume, which is just so absurd. Like, I can hardly even comprehend how crazy that is. <laughs> but, um, but the idea was it's kind of pointing towards a future, right, in which, um, you know, artificial intelligence becomes something that we can actually see and interact with. And, of course, anybody who, you know, has been to a concert or, you know, seen pretty much anything on TV knows that, that we, we're there. <laughs> we can do that now. Um, so it's, in, it's funny to kind of look, look back at a time when that, you know, was considered, um, I don't know, kind of out there. Um, so 
I think it's important to note that like, even though the technology moved on, this sort of um, purist aesthetic in computer art persists to this day. Um, there are plenty of artists that make work with a kind of minimalistic, uh, linear sort of effect. Do they have the ability to do more? Of course. Um, do they have the ability to, you know, engage with color and all of these other, you know, parts of the visual experience? Oh, totally, they do. Um, it's almost like a little bit of a nostalgic kind of thread in computer art, and it's still, it's still going on. Um, I could show, I probably will show you at some point stuff from, um, you know, last year that uh, very much kind of um, evokes this uh, same sort of sensibility. Um, this artist is really notable, and he's another, he's another person that's pretty, actually pretty interesting to Google. Um, his name's Harold, Harold Cohen. He was a British um, painter, and uh, he made boring abstract paintings, and then one day he just decided, I want to get into technology. Um, and so he did. Um, he uh, basically developed a, an AI system for generating imagery, and he would generate these sort of jungle landscapes. Um, and I think Harold Cohen is probably interesting to talk about because he's, he's pretty much, I'm fairly certain, um, I could back this up, uh, he's pretty much the first artist to really engage with AI algorithms um, for his sort of image selection. So, so like in this um, image, the rocks would maybe all be separate graphics files and they would have parameters associated with them, like how large they are, how squished or, you know, the shape. Um, and so this is a pretty simple iteration of one of his works because it's black and white. He actually moved on to deal with color and to go beyond kind of linear compositions. We're going to spend a whole uh, talk talking about AI and how it interacts with contemporary art. So um, that's definitely like a, an interesting topic and we'll be coming back to the idea of AI. So when we think about the 90s, um, and this is going to be on the exam, the, the main sort of distinguishing characteristic of the 90s is that it was the era in, of the internet. Um, and if we want to be more specific, the World Wide Web. Um, of course, the internet predates the 90s. The internet goes all the way back to the 70s. Um, but uh, the World Wide Web was something that was kind of an innovation that happened in the 90s. And it allowed you to create like a very primitive uh, HTML website and post pictures of yourself and you know do all that important stuff that we do with our sort of personal web spaces um, and you know really sort of pre pre social media you know allowing you to put yourself out there on the internet. Um, so a lot of artists engaged with the internet in the 90s. It was sort of the thing to do. Um, and some of that, some of the artists that made work about the internet were sort of like super optimistic. Like, and when I say super optimistic, I mean like they were in a sort of thread of art making and culture called transhumanism. And they were like, yes, you know, like I'll put myself on the internet and then I'll become a virtual entity and then I'll, you know, like leave my material body and everything <laughs> will become more interesting. Um, it, like really like way out there. Um, like they just got off the train from Burning Man and they made a website, you know. Um, so there's definitely like that type of activity that starts to happen in the 90s and actually Burning Man started in the 90s. Um, but what you also see is, you know, there was a, a fair thread of people who were really interested in using the internet as a tool for kind of questioning things like governments and stuff like that. So um, there's a whole sort of genre of work um, in the late 90s and early 2000s that I like to call doing stuff on the internet. Um, and it's uh, literally take anything that you would consider doing um, and putting it, put, put it on the internet and call it art. Um, so brushing your teeth, uh, you know, uh, taking a video of yourself brushing your teeth and putting it on the internet. 
profound. I'm being somewhat sarcastic. Um, this is a sort of like more elevated version of doing stuff on the internet. Um, this um, artist has actually made like um, a ro interactive robot that you can get to from a web page. Um, and so there's like a whole, like probably a dozen examples that I could rattle off of people sort of connecting the physical world to the internet and then having people jump on a website and interact with it. Um, I saw a show at UCLA probably in the early, early 2000s, and there was a guy who made a frog that was completely implanted with motors in his bones. And so you could get on the internet and you could go to some graphical representation of the frog, and you could make the frog do different dances. And this poor frog would be like, hey, I'm a frog. And it was kind of super disturbing and super weird. Um, but there was a lot of this uh, sort of idea of just thinking about you know, what the boundaries of networks are, right? And how, how far they can kind of go into the actual so-called real world. So doing stuff on the internet, definitely a thing in the 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, you also see in the late 90s this kind of idea of digital photography becoming something that, number one, is technologically achievable um, because computers just got to that point where they could handle it. Um, and uh, also on kind of a fine art level. Um, so this is a really interesting artist named Marika Mori who was very sort of high profile in the 90s. Um, sh the thing to point out about this work is that it's done at an incredibly high resolution and it's the size of a wall. Like, it's probably, probably not too different from the size of these dividers, right? So that's actually a, a whole lot of hard drive space um, for the 90s. <laughs> um, I could probably do that on my laptop today, but uh, for 1996, it's quite a lot of pixels. Um, and, you know, it's also uh, worth noting that in this image, Marika Mori is like bringing uh, a sort of like, um, kind of looking askance um, at her own cultural history and bringing it into this sort of technological space and virtual space where, you know, these like ancient rituals from um, Buddhism, you know, become sort of, uh, virtualized or um, put into the maybe real or not real world. So kind of moving forward, like um, getting into the aughts and getting into the nows, um, basically what kind of what we're looking at is two things. Um, this whole sort of obviously bigger, better, faster, we have better machines, we can do we can have more shapes, we can have a higher resolution of polygons, we can have more pixels, higher color depth, everything is you know, just expanded in that way. Um, you also start to see, and this is peculiar to like the last 10 or 15 years, you also start to see um, people making work that's sort of fundamentally nostalgic towards some of the early technological work, like work done in the 80s. And basically what you have is like, people who are in their 30s, 20s or 30s, sort of looking back to their childhood um, at things that you know, they may think are interesting. Um, you also start to see this kind of like ba backlash against technology. I mean, that's just kind of part of our current culture, right? Um, that it's, um, I mean, I'm sure we all have different relationships with our own sort of like technological life, um, but you know there have been uh, critiques about what technology does to people cognitively, um, what technology does to people psychologically, uh, what technology does to our society politically. Um, those are sort of all critiques that are happening right now around technology, and so. Um, there are artists that are sort of trying to address that. Um, and in this work, um, Benjamin Edwards, who's a really interesting painter, um, he actually simulates these environments in a custom software engine 
and then he uh, paints them. And he's always been interested in this idea of like digital delirium or like being overwhelmed by all the input and all the stuff that's kind of just swirling around. Um, I'm sure we've all had that feeling of, you know, being a little ADD around the internet. Um, you also see artists that are sort of um, using scientific technologies around data visualization um, to create imagery. It's got kind of a powerful theme in the last several years. There's another data visualization. Um, and more data visualization. And you also start to see this sort of re-emergence of interest in code-based art. And I would say that's probably one of the most powerful um, tendencies of like the last 20 years um, is this sort of emergence of code-based art. Um, so these are all um, images that are fairly recent, right? They're made in the last five years. Um, but in terms of the formal characteristics, like how they look visually, they're not super different from the images that we looked at at the beginning of the lecture, right? Um, so it's sort of a reemergence of that sensibility. Um, and we'll look at some other work later in the semester that kind of is the polar opposite of this. Um, you know, we'll look at 3D animation that looks completely indistinguishable from photography or, um, you know, other sorts of uh, tendencies. But, um, yeah, I think that this, um, you know, idea that maybe you don't need all the pixels or you don't need all the um, polygons or all the points, you know, to um, make something interesting is actually like a really powerful idea for moving forward um, as a field. So I'm going to stop there. Um, does anyone have any quick questions before we break up? All right. Yes. Yes. So earlier you said something about how when something is useful, technically art, is that your personal opinion or is that like the stance of some people in the area? Um, I don't really, uh, no, it's not my personal opinion. Um, it's uh, generally, if something's useful, it gets, it gets lumped into the, the, into the category of design. Um, and I think that that's, you know, there are instances that I can come up with where a useful object is considered art, but just in a general kind of broad brush thinking, that's... Um, that's definitely like a way of delineating what the difference between art and design is. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Other question? Yeah. Yeah, so it's called like an ASCII impact printer, and it's a, it's a, it's a ball that just has like raised letters on it and then it spins around and smacks the paper with a, like a ribbon. Have you ever seen a typewriter? Yeah. yeah. It's very similar to a typewriter. Um, ex yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, and that was, they, they did that because the technology for creating like dots didn't exist. Yeah. Okay, well, I, if you, I, I can take more questions at the podium, but um, I'm happy to talk with you all. Um, I will uh, see you all on Thursday.